thank you so much everyone for coming it's lovely to see such a full room so uh, i really appreciate you uh, spending time here to learn about cilium and how you can use cilium cluster mesh to really make it very very easy to deploy your services across multi-cloud and multi-cluster i'm going to try and get these out of the way they're a bit i don't think they make any difference because i'm using this so okay great uh, I work with Isovalent, who are the company that originally created Cilium, so I have the uh, pleasure and privilege of working with some incredibly talented engineers there. I've also been very involved in the CNCF over the years uh, with the Technical Oversight Committee and now the Governing Board. I also work with the Open UK Board as well. So, Cilium uh, Cluster Mesh is not really a new thing. So really what I'm going to be talking about today, there's no new launch, but this is really about diving a little bit more into what cluster mesh is, how it works, how easy it is to use. And I wanted to also just talk a little bit about my experiences of uh, connecting clusters in multiple clouds. I'm going to do something ever so slightly reckless, which is that I do actually have uh, a cluster running in EKS, so I'm going to be trying to use the Wi-Fi, uh, and I have another cluster running in Google Cloud. So let's hope that I will be able to continue talking to those clusters for the next half hour or so. Is, is that big enough for everyone to see? Yes. Yep, great, good. So. Cluster Mesh really enables us to distribute the functionality that you get in Cilium across multiple clusters, whether those clusters are running kind of co-located in the same cloud, perhaps they're in multiple different regions, perhaps they are, as I'm going to do today, running in different public clouds. And there are all sorts of reasons why you might want to do that. So the first thing you need to do is actually connect those two different clusters. And this isn't really anything to do with Cilium. This is about how you set up a connection. In my case, I have connected my VPC in Google and my VPC in AWS with a VPN connection. So one thing you have to do is learn the terminology of what these things are called in AWS and what they're called in Google or what they're called in Azure. The, the terminology might be slightly different in different places. The interfaces might look slightly different in different places. But you are essentially trying to set up something that's symmetrical. So I've got, yeah, a VPC. Uh, essentially, a, I've got one subnet in uh, the Amazon cloud. And I want to be able to get connectivity between that and my VPC in Google Cloud. To make things kind of easy, I tried to use dot five for my Google Cloud and dot six for my Amazon Cloud, although it turned out Google also wanted to allocate a few other IP addresses for pods and services. But I shall refer to them as five and six occasionally. We have this VPN connection. It actually consists of two VPN tunnels that link those two clusters. But we also have to advertise the addresses from either end so that if the Google cluster sees an address that's 10.6, it knows oh, I'm going to reach that through the VPN connection. If the AWS side, if, if a, a node there is looking for a 10.5 address, or a couple of other uh, subnets, it needs to know I'm going to reach it through the VPN connection. So you set up uh, something called something like a virtual private gateway on your cloud, on your, attach it to your VPC, and it, you have a kind of virtual representation of the remote end, and you run BGP to advertise the addresses through that VPN connection. Cilium does not really care about any of this, which is why if you run cluster mesh in uh, you know, kind nodes on, on a local machine, it will look exactly the same as it will here, running it in two different, completely different clouds. Cilium really just doesn't care about how those two clusters are connected. 
It does, however, care about being able to route or route, if there are any Americans in the audience, uh, <laughs> being able to understand how to reach IP addresses. And they need to be unique. You couldn't have, I mean, here I've got 10.5 in Google. Couldn't also have 10.5, uh, you know, the same subnet in the Amazon cloud because it would be very confusing. How would you know where to route to? So we need n unique IP addresses, non-overlapping sets of IP addresses uh, for the pods and also for the nodes. So once you set up this VPN connection, we've got BGP announcing routes uh, from one end to the other, you get a routing table at either end. This is the Amazon end. And what you can see here is the orange uh, entry in this table says everything that starts 10.6 is local, it's on this VPC. Everything that's 10.5 or these other two subnets that Google allocated, I'm going to reach through this virtual gateway. So that's really saying go through the VPN tunnel. And then anything else, it's just on the internet. So reach it through the internet gateway to the, to the outside world. And there's a similar kind of uh, symmetric version of the same thing in the Google end of this. So again, here it's got those three subnets that are in the Google Cloud, they're routed locally. If you want to reach the Amazon Cloud, for reasons that I can't give you a good explanation for, it lists as two different tunnels in the Google side, but it's just seen as one combined connection on the Amazon side. There are two tunnels in both cases, but you can reach those addresses through either of those VPN tunnels from uh, Google's perspective. And then if you had an address that wasn't 10.5 or 10.6 or 10. whatever, you would go through the default internet gateway. So these root tables tell us how the nodes in one cluster are going to be able to reach, you know, which interface to use to reach the remote end. Now, I could probably spend 50 minutes doing a talk about how long it took me to realise you also have to propagate the routes. This is a pretty uh, annoying checkbox if you're trying to set these up. You have to tell the virtual private gateway to inform the nodes in your subnet about those remote addresses, otherwise they just don't know how to reach the remote end. In addition, Having set up the routes, you also have to have the right permissions to send traffic. So typically, when you set up a, a VPC in a cloud, it will create some default rules for you that will let you send traffic within that VPC. So maybe it's going to say, permit all the 10.5 traffic in my 10.5 VPC. But you have to configure your own rules to say, I also want to be able to accept traffic from this remote cluster. And we don't have time or inclination, and it's really nothing to do with Cilium, but you need to know to set up the firewall rules or the security groups or the network access control lists to allow, at both ends, the remote traffic. Otherwise, it's not going to be, you know, it can get to the, uh, the remote VPC, but then it can't get to the destination node. So, having got your connection between your two different clusters, now we can start talking about Cilium, and we can start talking about enabling Cilium Cluster Mesh. So, we have to give each cluster a unique name and ID, because otherwise they'd get confused about each other. So, I've called them five and six. Uh, one of them's EKS, one of them's GKE. And uh, they do need to be using the same routing mode. Cilium can either use native routing, which means, well, I'll talk about the, the other option is encapsulation or, or an overlay mode in which your packets get kind of encapsulated in a bigger packet. So you have to be using the same encapsulation at either end, otherwise 
the packet that you received would have a weird address that you didn't expect. In my case, I've got native routing at both ends. OK, so I'm not going to do this live because it's, it's already set up that uh, cluster mesh is enabled. When you run the cluster mesh enable command, what it creates for you is this cluster mesh API server. So let's just make sure that our uh, uh, cluster meshes are up and running, that our whole systems are up and running correctly. And let's hope we're going to get Wi-Fi to tell us that Cilium is up and running. Uh, we'll come back to it. What we should see is something like this, which includes OK for cluster mesh. And it will have deployed a pod and a service for cluster mesh API server. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a second. I'll just talk about the, the API service for a moment. So when you enable cluster mesh, you get this API service that allows remote clusters to learn about the services on that cluster. So each agent is going to listen to the remote uh, API services that it's connected to for cluster mesh so that it can learn about the services that are running on that cluster. So let's see whether, yeah, okay, it's come back in both places and we can see cluster mesh is okay in EKS and it is okay in GKE, great. And if we take a look at the services, I think it's in um, Cube system, let's just check. Yeah, we should see here we've got the Cluster Mesh API service running here, accessible externally. Great. Uh, so the, the bit that I skipped over is uh, running Cluster Mesh status, where this tells us whether or not clusters are connected. I haven't connected them yet, so they're not, but we would see, well, I have in real life, but in my slides I haven't. Uh, so we would see that the cluster information would be available on this service. I'm now ready to be connected to a remote cluster. And we do that with Cluster Mesh Connect. And all we need to do is pass in the cube config context. So in the same way that you set up your context, if you're running a cube control command or a, how, how many people say cube cuttle? How many people say cube CTL? Do we have any cube control folk? I hope to convert you. Cube control. <laughs> when you run a cube control, or you can just say K, like I do, have an alias, that's, that's the easy way. Um, so if you're running cube control, by default, you're going to pick up uh, your cube config, or you can specify a context, and, and specify a, a, a config file. Cilium Cluster Mesh is going to run some, essentially run against your Kubernetes cluster locally, and also the remote cluster that you're connecting to. So in this example, when I ran this, I ran it on cluster six, and I said I want to connect to cluster five. And it looked uh, locally and remotely and uh, figured out how to connect those two uh, services to each other and send each other the information about the remote API service. So if I look at the cluster mesh status, we should be connected in both cases, I hope. OK, good. We've got uh, global services of one in both cases, and we can see the remote end in both cases. So good. All right. It looks like that. So now we can run global Kubernetes services that are accessible from both those places. Or since I like to have Star Wars themes demos, let's consider them as intergalactic Kubernetes services. So all we need to do to make a service intergalactic, global, is we just have to annotate it as global is true. There are a couple of other annotations I can use that I will be showing. And to make my life easier, I've added them all in. But if I look at my rebel base service, 
we should see, yeah, it's got global marked as true, yeah? And the same should also be true in the remote end. Yeah, global is true. The shared also means not only is this a global service, but also I am prepared to advertise it to my, uh, my neighboring galaxies. So that means I can, actually let's uh, run it a few times. Yeah, so I can exec into my X-wing in this galaxy, and if I uh, send a message to the rebel base, sometimes it's gonna get to the local galaxy, sometimes it's gonna get to the remote galaxy, and sometimes we're gonna hit like, you know, live demo issues, which we'll gloss over, because that's, that's a bug. But yeah, so randomly it's picking between the local and the remote cluster. And we could do the same thing from this end as well. Um, yeah. Mm, it's taking a bit longer. Actually, I've got a timeout on this one for a reason. I'll do that again without the timer, and hopefully we will see. Timeout. Hopefully we will see. I hope we're going to see responses from both. Clusters. Maybe one cluster is, uh, I'm going to say the EKS cluster maybe is responding a bit more slowly. Maybe it's the Wi-Fi, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see both ends, live demos. Okay, so what's happening here? We've got an X-Wing pod. In this particular case, I'm, I'm only, well, I'm, I am sending requests from both sides, but my diagram shows my X-Wing making a request to the, rebel based service and I used the name so there was a DNS lookup that uh, kind of converts the name to a service IP address and then like in any other Kubernetes service we're going to load balance from that service IP address to one of the available backends. Okay so uh, let's have a look at the Services and get service. Let's have a look at the services. And we can see there's a few services here. Uh, here's the, the rebel base service. And if I describe that service, again, I did this a minute ago, but we're going to look at something slightly different. Okay, so that's got two back end endpoints. I hope that's visible enough. Um, so there are two IP addresses, and they correspond to the local pods. So here are two pods, 10.6.1.60, 10.6.9.41. And yet, when I ran my request, sometimes they were getting responded to from my remote cluster. And uh, if I give up waiting for this, but try and look at the pods here. Yeah, so these have 10.172 addresses. So how, if Kubernetes only knows about the local services, how are they getting uh, sometimes sent to the remote addresses? And the answer is that Cilium knows about them. So, if I uh, exec into my Cilium pod here, I think it needs to be a cube system, and I run command, I think it's endpoint list, let's try that. And we can see the endpoints that this, uh, uh, this Cilium pod knows about. And uh, if I, I need service list, that's, what, that's the one that's more interesting. Service list is gonna tell me how a service relates to pods that are the back ends for that service. And got a great memory, I can tell you that this was the service address for Rebel Base, and there are four entries here. So we've got a couple of 10.6 addresses, those are the local uh, pods, and we've also got some 10.172 addresses, which are the remote pods. 
So cilium is going to service, uh, so load balance across those four pods, and sometimes it's going to choose a 10.6 address that will just get routed locally in the local VPC. And sometimes it's going to pick a 10.172 address, which is going to get routed over that VPN tunnel to the remote cluster. It's as simple as that. Kubernetes doesn't know about it, but Cilium does. OK, this is why it's important for those pod addresses not to overlap, because of the, the need to be able to route the pod addresses, to be able to route to different destination pods. So what can we do with the ability to send a request to remote galaxies, I mean, other than being able to contact different uh, rebel bases? Well, we might choose to uh, do topology-aware routing. We might choose to say, well, I would prefer a local service if a local service is available. But if the rebel base gets blown up or, in fact, doesn't exist on Dantooine, then uh, we'll just send traffic to uh, another cluster. So if I edit the service, oh, yeah, is that right? Yeah. And I'm going to change this affinity and say, I would prefer, I'm not sure I did that, yeah. Uh, I would prefer local pods. So now if I make some requests here, hopefully, since I'm running on the EKS cluster, we should see them all being responded to locally from Dantooine. I'm going to have to find out what it is that is causing the output to crash sometimes. But you can still see the responses are coming back every, you know, on a regular basis, always from Dantooine. That's because Dantooine is local, it's the EKS cluster, and I've preferred those pods. Now, if I uh, scale down those pods locally, so we'll, we'll basically remove them so there are no rebel bases locally. Let's check whether that's happened. OK, we've got no rebel base pods running locally now. And if I rerun my request, we should see them, fingers crossed, getting sent and responded to from Alderaan. Great. So that allows us to do things like fail over or gracefully move traffic from one uh, galaxy to another. Um, and it can allow us to you know, handle graceful moving of services, moving of traffic during something like an upgrade, for example. We also have the option to prefer a remote uh, cluster. So we could uh, scale the pods back up again. Let's, let's do that. And uh, I'm going to edit the service again. Remote, we'll prefer the remote pods. And even though hopefully we've got some pods back up again here, yeah, we've got two rebel bases here, but we should nevertheless see any responses getting preferred routed to Alderaan in the Google cluster. Uh, the other thing I could do is I could decide that uh, Alderaan doesn't want to receive this traffic. Uh, so we could change this side to say, you know what, although it is a global service and I would like to be able to reach both clusters, I don't want to share. <laughs> okay. So we should find this side can go to either destination. But this side, I don't know what's happening, why it's not going to. 
So even though on the EKS side, I would prefer to be going to the remote cluster because the remote cluster is not prepared to share with me, I'm getting all my responses locally. Live demo gods are not behaving very well for me in the Google Cloud, apparently. Okay. Um, right. So we can prefer a local endpoint. We can prefer a remote endpoint. And we can prefer local but fail over to remote if there are no local endpoints available. Another thing that we can do that just works seamlessly is network policy. And we can apply Cilium network policies with uh, cluster-specific information. So an example would be something like this, where we can say, I'm only going to allow the, a local uh, pod or something that has the X-Wing class label, but it also has to be in my local cluster on the EKS cluster, those are the only ones that are going to be allowed to contact the rebel base. I'm beginning to have a suspicion why that uh, wasn't working a minute ago. So if I apply that policy, policy, okay, yeah, it's unchanged. That's why the remote end can't get there. Let's delete it. Let's actually, let's uh, just, yeah, no, let's delete the CNP ingress, hopefully. Yeah. I think that might well be, that might well explain why I wasn't getting responses at this end. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> So if I put the policy back in again, we wouldn't see those responses. <laughs> and we would be able to see, so let's take a look at some uh, Hubble traffic. Uh, I've got another one. Yeah, we want to look at some policy verdicts. Oh, I need to port forward my Hubble. So Hubble is uh, going to let us see individual packet flows, and I'm just going to look at the ones in the galaxy far, far away that are policy verdicts. And, uh, oh, I removed that policy. Let me add the policy back again, sorry. Um, policy. Okay. And I think we should see occasionally that, uh, there we go, yes. Start seeing requests from the Google cluster getting denied because of that, uh, that policy. Now, one thing that's kind of, I don't know, just a little subtlety is if I look at the, um, the pod, let's get pods uh, and look at the labels, there is a, po a, a label talking about the X-Wing class. There is no label saying that it's in that particular cluster. So it's a kind of implicit, automatically applied label that we're, um, that we're looking at with this uh, policy. You know, it says match labels. It's an uh, implicit label. And if we looked in the... I'm going to actually do it here because I know I've got the Cilium. Oh, no. I know I've got this environment variable set up. Um, this is why I wanted to do endpoint list because somewhere in here we should see, well, I'll try and find the right X wing. Where's X wing? You're in here somewhere, I'm sure you are. There's a lot of rep. Here we go. So this is the X-Wing pod, or the endpoint that happens to be in that X-Wing pod. And we can see, hopefully somewhere, there should be, yes, the implicit label saying that the cluster is the EKS cluster. So that's 
what uh, what Cilium is using to match against that uh, that policy that specifies the cluster. Okay. So it is a very big universe out there. So the question is, how many galaxies can we connect? And the answer is that we can, it used to be a limit of 255, and it's now 511, which it turns out is all ones in binary, so I think that's why. Uh, if we look, I, I've actually currently got it connected to only 255, because I really wouldn't have the uh, patience to set up another 509 clusters for this demo. <laughs> um, the trade-off you get is that you, uh, because we need to be able to uh, convey the, the identity, and the identity includes the kind of cluster, so you have fewer possible security identities in each cluster if you decide to go beyond that 255 limit. So if you are working in a universe with a lot of galaxies, you may have to uh, have, well, it's still quite a lot of uh, security identities. Uh, yeah, I was gonna mention KV Stormesh, which is really the uh, change that's gone in relatively recently, I think it was 1.14 actually, um, to, uh, essentially have a cache of all that information that we're learning from those remote cluster API services. Uh, and that enables us to scale beyond the 255 to the 500-odd to the limit and uh, still get decent performance. So I hope that's shown you that cluster mesh is pretty e I mean, all you have to do is annotate a service, and you can make it available across clusters. You can uh, decide whether to prefer traffic locally or remotely. And you get all of these capabilities of Cilium that are just shared across clusters, which I think is almost magical. So I hope you want to try it out for yourselves. And if you do, there are some really great labs on isovalent.com slash labs. They are um, available merely for the price of your email address. Uh, and uh, you can explore Cluster Mesh without having to go through the trouble of setting up clusters. And uh, it will walk you through all that process. You can also come to the isovalent booth. We've got a number of different uh, labs running over there. And later on, well, this evening at, at half past six, I'm going to be signing some books if you want to come along and say hello. So thank you for exploring the galaxy of uh, Cluster Mesh with me today.